I'm Penny Green and I'm the assistant manager at the Burt Cobb Rec Center. Today we are going to make mini chicken pot pies. For this recipe you are going to need some refrigerator pie crust, some canned chicken, canned peas and carrots, and cream of chicken soup. To start this recipe we are going to go ahead and take our pie crust. It works best if you've worked with it at room temperature. I've already got the toaster oven um, preheating to 350. If you have a biscuit cutter, this would be a great time to use it. I'm just going to use the big end of a cup. And then. do now that you have your six bottom crusts is I am going to just take this and set it to the side. Don't discard it because we are going to need it to cover the top of our pot pies. So you're going to take your muffin pan, go ahead and use some non-stick cooking spray. I use butter flavor just because who doesn't love butter? And then what I like to do is manipulate them just so they fit in there nice and good. And then you're just going to continue that for all six or twelve or however many. I find that one nine inch pie crust is enough to do six of these little mini pot pies. This is fun because it gives the kids the opportunity to choose what they want in theirs and be part of the little cooking project. This cooking project, because we are working with heat, I would say ages eight and up as far as the mixing and um, the combining and the putting everything together, definitely adult supervision taking it out of the oven. Once we have our bottom crust in the muffin pan like that, we're going to set that aside. Then you're going to take your ingredients. You're going to take a can of the canned chicken, the peas and carrots. I just use a small can. And then I've got a can of the cream of chicken soup. If you want it a little um, thinner, you can add some milk, and then you're just gonna mix it up. Kids two and up would be able to help with this part of the recipe. Go ahead and season it to preference. I'm just gonna add some salt, some pepper, and a little bit of garlic. This would be, um, an option to add frozen mixed vegetables. You could add um, fresh vegetables. Fresh vegetables would increase the cooking time. So once we have our filling mixed together, we are just gonna fill. So the one can of chicken, the one can of cream of chicken soup, and the one can of small peas and carrots are going to be enough to make 12 of these mini pot pies. So once we have them filled as such, we are going to go back to our dough 
and we are gonna roll to put the tops on. You can get fancy with this if you want. I'm just gonna continue to make um, circles if you wanna do like a lattice top, you can. If you don't wanna roll and you just wanna piece together the parts, you can do that also. My daughter earlier today, when she was helping me prepare for this cooking project, she just actually ripped the parts of the dough and it worked just as well and turned out just as good. So if you wanted to do that, you could do that too. So I'm just gonna roll a little bit. Once again, manipulate the edges. And then when you get in there, I kind of just like to push down and around to kind of seal. I'm gonna just use some of these loose pieces. Because when you're cooking with kids, it is an experience. It gives them the opportunity um, to work with different utensils and different appliances. And at the end of the day, you're teaching them about healthy nutrition and being able to make foods that they can enjoy themselves or with little to no supervision. So as you can see, that's how we are gonna get those going. I'm gonna go ahead and set this to the side. Once you get all your little pot pies Popped. You can go ahead and take a knife and put little slits in the top. It's not necessary. You can baste the top with butter if you want. Um, it doesn't hurt. I don't necessarily do it every time. It's all about preference. And then you're going to go ahead and put them in there about 350, 375 for about 25 minutes. So let me show you what those look like when they are done. one of these delicious chicken pot pies. Hi, I'm Ms. Pat, Education Associate at the Customs House Museum and Cultural Center. And today we're going to build an edible log cabin. We're going to be using pretzel rods, graham crackers, and chocolate frosting. We're going to start by building our base on a cardboard plate. A uh, ceramic type of plate probably won't work as well because it won't stick very well. We're going to take a generous amount of chocolate frosting and smooth it onto the bottom portions of the pretzels. We're going to stick that down on the plate. Then just like the log cabin that we have in the museum, we're going to start to alternate the tree trunks, or in this case, the pretzel logs, as we build up our walls. We're going to use the chocolate frosting at the corners to be like a glue to hold it together. This is an authentic log cabin that we have on display at the Customs House Museum. This is what you think of when you think of what kind of houses did the pioneer and early settlers live in when they moved out west. I want to talk a little bit about how it was put together. The first thing they had to do was to clear the land of any trees that were already there. And then they had to cut down trees 
first things they had to do when they got the logs back to the home site was to trim them and to hew them. It's called hewn. To use an axe to strip off the bark. You can feel it. When you come to the museum, you can use your hands and you can actually feel the marks that the axe. Then just like with a real log cabin, we're just going to keep alternating back and forth as we build up our walls. They would lay the logs horizontally, going this way and that way. And they would intersect at the corner. They didn't even need nails to build the long cabin because they carved in notches at the ends of the logs and look how nicely they fit together. Press down gently, not too hard, you don't want to break the pretzel. Now notice in between the logs we have a space, we have a gap. They filled in that gap with something called daubing or chinking. That's where they would mix mud or clay with straw, twigs, even corn cobs and rocks. And they would slather that in between the logs to help insulate the cabin and keep it warm. Interesting here. Now as we build up our walls, we are going to take a lot of chocolate frosting and smooth it on the inside of the walls. This is like the daubing that they did on log cabins, like the log cabin we have at the museum. As we're doing this, it's pushing the frosting through the logs, filling in those spaces, just like the real log cabin. The inside of this log cabin is typical of a frontier log cabin. It's basically one room. The whole family would live in this one room. It has a loft for sleeping. It has a stone fireplace. All log cabins had that. And that was for warmth and also a place for cooking. It was common for log cabins to have a few windows. However, back in the old days, a lot of settlers didn't have glass, so they would use greased paper as their window. I'm going to spread some more chocolate frosting inside where it needs more daubing. Now, can you imagine what it would be like as a whole family to grow up in basically one room with no indoor plumbing, no electricity, how would you get by? Let's start with their source of light. No electricity, you can't turn the lights on. Let's look around and see if we can find some sources of light. Well, of course, the windows provided light, and then they used candles. We see some candles there that have been dipped that are hanging from the ceiling. This is a candle mold that would have been used to make candles. Now I'm ready to install the roof. We're going to use four pretzel rods for the roof. And we're going to form them as a triangle in the log cabin. 
using the chocolate frosting as a glue. Let's say you want some butter on your bread. Well, you can't just run to the store and get some butter. You'd have to make your own. Over there, that barrel looking thing with a stick in it, that's a butter churn. You'd have to use the milk from your cows and make your own butter. What about the now the next thing we're going to do is take another pretzel rod and put it on top of the triangle. Once again, using the chocolate frosting as a glue. Make sure that you have plenty of chocolate frosting on the part of the roof structure that's down in the cabin to help hold those triangles together. Next thing we're going to do is put the roof on using graham crackers and once again being very generous with the chocolate frosting as glue. You can't run to the mall buy your clothes so you'd have a loom. Perhaps you'd have some sheep and you'd get wool from the sheep and you would make your own fabric. No indoor plumbing, but it's the middle of the night, it's raining, it's cold, you don't want to go to the outhouse. So every log cabin would have a chamber pot. This is the original log cabin that the Powers family lived in. It's not a reconstruction. It was moved to the museum in 1986 and they put it back together, log by log. Interesting to note, when you come to the museum and have a look for yourself, the Powers, Barnabas and Susanna's youngest son, Elijah Wilson Powers, carved his initials on the outside of the cabin. It'd be kind of fun when you come by, see if you can find them. Okay, this last part of the roof here is going to overlap the other parts of the roof. So I'm going to put some of our chocolate frosting glue down that side too. That's our edible log cabin. My name is Raymond Rosado. I work upstairs at the uh, information desk at your Clarksville Montgomery County Public Library. Today, I'm going to be reading The Blue and the Gray by Evie Bunting and illustrated by Ned uh, Bitterling. My dad and I and JJ Huff, my friend, stand here in what will be our house when it is done. Three doors from us is JJ's house. It's great he'll be that close to me. Above us, workmen hammer nails and talk of baseball games they've seen. Tall ladders lean against the houses, cross beams between like catwalks. The three of us look out across the field, all hillock and hummock with tufted grasses and stubby flowers, white as new sprinkled snow the kind that grow where, wherever grass can grow. The field will stay the way it is for now. But long ago, my father says, it wasn't always so. In 1862, this was a battleground. And here, two armies fought and soaked the grass with blood. I guess the flowers were red instead of white that night. It was the Civil War, the North against the South, the Blue against the Gray, White against Black, White against White, Us against Us. To tell it right, my dad said, that's the saddest kind of war there is, though every war is sad, and most are bad. Behind us, there's a mound of wet cement and lumpy bags of ready mix. High up, a workman on a ladder scrapes the wall and pats it smooth as, frost, as frosting on a cake. He's careful round the porthole windows mother, mother wants. We'll have a view, she said. 
and lifted me so I could see the oak tree and the mountains. Let's walk across the field, my father says. You see that grassy hump? That's where the rebels and their horses hid and the orchard just beyond. My father knows the history of this place and he tells us that we must remember and revere. I didn't understand the word, but he explained. It means that we must honor all that happened here. We talk about it as we walk. I wonder if the rebels and their prayers said their prayers before they crossed this open field, and if the Union soldiers knew that they died too, the gray beside the blue. For in the end, my father says, this was a field of bones. Our dog is racing here today, chasing a blur of birds that lift and circle over him and land again beyond his reach. They fluff their feathers while he stumps and barks. Each bark is sharp enough to be a shot, but it is not. It was back then. On this wild field, two armies met. We won't forget. Their red flags tossed and flamed like fire. The barrels of their muskets, hard and black, gave back the dazzle of the sun. And on the ridge behind where we are now, the, the northern general stood. In days before the war began, the southern captain was his friend. But then he waited and that lonely ridge for friendship's end. Those two were friends before the war. J.J. moves closer still to me. It could have been brother against brother. Sometimes it was, my father says. We'd never, J.J. looks at me, we'd never, I agree. The little puffs of smoke burst like gray dust around the barrel of each rifle gun floated behind them as they'd run, man after man. Hard from the ridge, the Yankee gun re replied, and soldiers died. But at the house, there is the slam of wooden planks on wooden posts. Our air is filled with sawdust and the smell of newness. The high up workman shinnies down and gets a can of Coke. He takes his cap off, hand thick crusted with cement. We're getting there, he says. Soon, you'll be moving in. We grin. He looks across the field, nice here, nice view. It will be quiet too when, he, when we are gone. It wasn't then. The rebels among, almost reached the ridge before the Yankee cannons opened up, burst in a cloud of fire and smoke that rose above the trees, ripped legs and arms away. The flag had fallen in the dirt. Another soldier snatched it up. And still they came through buckshot, bullets, cannon shell. They came and fell. Some ran for cover, others lay like washing tossed upon the grass to dry. Some held their hand handkerchiefs above their heads to show surrender, and their moans and cries were carried, were carried on the battle smoke to heaven. I think the angels wept. Was it hard? Was it as hard as, as war and desert storm? My father thought in that. JJ looks closely at my dad. As hard, my father says. Hundreds of men were lost that day, they say. The carts that took away the wounded stretched for miles along the road. We turn to look. There's nothing on the road but passing cars, a yellow moving van, the workers' trucks parked on the side. We turn again to stare across the field. Though there are only birds to see, our dog is gone, moved on to look for dumber birds. It isn't far, JJ exclaimed. It isn't fair, JJ exclaimed. There ought to be a, mar a marker here. My father nods, there ought to be. So many battlegrounds have disappeared without a name. This one's the same. There'll be no marker here. Except our homes, I say, and all the other homes. All of those days, JJ agrees, 
when we play football on the field and sled when there is snow. And we will know the way it was and we'll remember. We'll be a monument of sorts, my father says, a part of what they fought for long ago. Maybe they know. I'll see. I'll, I say. I lift a piece of gravel that is lying close to where, we, where the builders dug. Its shape shaped just like a pigeon's egg, more pointed, flattened on one side. Is it a bullet? A hundred years and, and more, it's lain here. I'll keep it for a souvenir. No. I weigh it in my hand, then throw it high across the field of bones. How silently it falls into the tufts of grass and flowers. The resting birds rise up together, fly. I see their wings, blue and gray, against the shine of the sky. Thank you very much. Have a good day. I'm Gracie with the Clarksville Montgomery County Public Library. And I'm Joanna. Joanna, what song are we going to do for them today? We're going to do the Grand Old Duke of York. And this one, if you're sitting down, you're going to want to stand up, just wiggle everything out, get all warmed up. And we're going to go through it slow the first time. And then we'll do some other stuff after. So you're going to, first off, you're going to need to be marching in place. March, march in place. March. And the words go like this. Oh, the Grand Old Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill and he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down. Good job. <laughs> so now that we all know how it goes, let's see if we can speed it up a little bit and do it a little bit faster. I hope I can do that. <laughs> I think you got it. And I think you guys have it at home too. That's all right. Ready? Ready? Oh, the grand old Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill and he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down. <sighs> and you can keep that going as long as you want to at home. Speed it up every time, see how fast you can do it. Go. Maybe do it really slow sometimes, so just have fun with it. Really slow. <laughs> slow motion. Yes, <laughs> that's what we have for you today. See you next time. Hi, welcome to the Craft Corner with Parks and Rec. I'm Penny Green, the assistant manager at the Burt Cobb Rec Center, and today I'm going to teach you how to make secret codes. For the first one, you're going to just need a pen, some paper, and a crayon of your choice. First thing you're going to do is you're going to write um, whatever your message or your picture is really hard with pen on your paper and then put that aside. What will be left is a blank piece of paper that you're going to pass off to whoever you're giving your note to. And then they're going to take a crayon and scribble over the paper with their crayon and as you can see, the message appears and it says 2020. I did it a little fun with a kind of 3D effect because this year we're doing our summer youth program virtually. That's why we get to bring you these fun videos. For the second secret code, you're going to need paper, a white crayon, and some watercolors. If you don't have watercolors, but you have food coloring available, you can just dilute a couple drops of the food coloring in water and use that the same. You're going to go ahead and draw your picture or write your message with the right white crayon. I went ahead and started it. Let me finish it really quick. And then when you're done with that, you're going to dip your brush in the water and voila. message will start to appear. Now these projects are probably going to be for older kids um, just because they're going to understand better what the process is.
but nothing's saying that an older child couldn't write with the white crayon and have the littles go ahead and paint all over it with their watercolors. And then as you can see, there's a happy sunshine for our summer youth program. Now the last one is going to require baking soda, water, and a little bit of grape juice. And what I've done is I've already went ahead and put the baking soda and the water in a cup. I'm gonna mix it together. For time's sake, I've already prepared my paper. And you're gonna use the Q-tip to write your message on the paper. And then once it's dry, you're going to take your trusty paintbrush, dip it in the grape juice, and magically your message will appear. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this segment of the Craft Corner with Parks and Rec and enjoy making those secret messages. See you next time, guys.